different metrics and in general, the audience on Amazon is a lot more gen pop and people who've never heard of you. Now, obviously there are individuals who do shop on Amazon that have, you know, do their shopping through there that don't shop through us, especially as we're starting to do um, Amazon Prime for some of our products and whatnot. But like up to now, we only have one product on Prime, at least as far as I know, and it's the uh, watermelon Amazon exclusive flavor. Um, but we will have more in the future. So up to now, it's been basically like new people who have been finding us on Amazon like organically and it's just interesting to see the disparity between like the average Amazon customer and the average like Shopify customer or just like straight up like going to our website. And I kind of stumbled across this by accident in terms of the rankings. Like I didn't actually look at what we were ranked for a while because I didn't think it would be anywhere like, I didn't even think it'd be relevant. So interestingly enough though, I found myself in the top 10 of Amazon and it, you know, got me thinking like, who's number one? Like, let me go compare the formulas. Let's see what the fuck is up. So. In sports nutrition, if you go to the pre-workout section, you find, now this is interesting because it's the pre-workout section. This is the top 10. You have C4, every var every variation of C4 essentially, then Redcon 1, Total War, then the classic Walmart pre-workout. Um, then you have like that, uh, you know, the super like, uh, I don't know, straight edge brand, very clean, very uh, feminine, Alani new pre-workout, which is like, all of the, uh, I don't know, it's just like, it has a very, very, just like Gorilla Mind has like a very, a stereotypical audience, I guess. Like a lot of people would probably put you into a certain camp of individual if you buy that kind of a product. The Alani New thing is like, you know, a certain kind of demographic probably skews towards that. Like you would not find a Gorilla Mind customer buying Alani New, nor would you find an Alani New customer buying our shit, um, at least in most cases. Interestingly enough, Super Beats, the most fucking trash product ever. If you want to see me absolutely die, scientifically dismantle beetroot products, go watch my Gorilla Mode Nitric Breakdown. It is literally a fucking movie explaining my pre-workout. It's like an hour and a half long. Obviously, you don't want to watch the full thing. Go to the pinned comment in the timestamps. You'll see um, beetroot versus, like, I don't even remember what the title of it is, but there's a subsection. You can jump right to that part of the video and see me explain why this is dumb to use. And it's surprising that it's number seven. But anyways, this, again, Amazon has their own criteria and it's kind of interesting what gets ranked. Um, so the weird thing is, is in general pre-workouts, we're ranked number 14. Now, this fucking Redwood by Umzu is fucking 11. So this just goes to show what Amazon rankings really mean at the end of the day. <laughs> Um, and again, like some of the stuff that makes no sense to be here. What is it based on? As far as I know, it's mostly sales velocity. So it doesn't necessarily mean your product's better or worse if it's ranked higher. Rather, it has to do with the demographic on Amazon, the sales velocity, and you know, like look at these fucking reviews, dude. Like over 20,000 reviews, over 3,000 reviews here. Like these products are heavily, heavily, you know, bought by Gen Pop and are far more mainstream appealing than something like Gorilla Mode, which is basically like a maxed out product for the consumer who wants high performance with the maxed out efficacious dosages of everything. Whereas these other products compared to Gorilla Mode are more like mainstream appealing. You know, they're designed for being, having like a more, I don't know, attractive entry price point. Like for example, like a Beats product. Actually, fuck, how much does this cost? Uh, ba -ba -ba. Whoa, 64.90. Okay, never mind, dude. Uh, well, I guess it comes with a greens product with it. It forces you to get it. Um, but yeah, some of these products, like for example, C4 Sport, the top ranked pre workout of all time, apparently is only fucking $19.92, which, like, you can see what kind of consumer they're going after when they make this kind of a product. So, anyways, the weird thing is in nitric oxide boosters, for some reason, it's a subcategory. And instead of finding Gorilla Mode Nitric ranked at the top or like above, where the fuck are we? We were just number 10, like, literally the other day. Like, here we are, like, here we are, number 10. Oh, we're in powder, sorry. Pre workout subsection powders were number 10. The weird thing though is like, I would have thought you'd find us at a higher spot in nitric oxide boosters, but I cannot, uh, I cannot find us. Like you have people that are selling a fucking, <laughs> like some of the stuff I've never even heard of, dude. AKG capsule somehow is ranked higher than us. Like, I guess, again, it's the consumer that you're trying to appeal to. Ageless male tonight. Fucking some gas station pills right there, ranked in the top, you know, 40 or whatever. So anyway, here we are number 10 in powders, which I guess this is uh, the subsection underneath pre-workout to exclude all of the capsule products. And um, this is the competition, dude. This is who, 
Like, beta alanine raw powder is ranked fucking 11. Like, that just goes to show how ridiculous this is. So anyways, going to C4 Sport, we're gonna look at that. I'm gonna compare it to uh, Rip Sport, the original. Um, do I wanna dissect the rest of this shit? Uh, let's see what's in the Walmart pre-workout. I've seen that a million times. I'm kinda interested to see what's in it. Um, I've gone over Bucked Up before. Not really a point of going into that again. Ooh, C4 Ultimate. Let's see what that's it's in this shit. $34.99. So is this like their, their premium product that has like a ribbed label and shit? So let's go down to these sub facts. Actually, let's start with their number one product on planet Earth. It is C4 Sport um, Pre-Workout Powder. I believe that was the top one. Yeah. So let's see what this fucking thing has. So we go down 9 gram scoop size, 30 servings, and we have a nice, meaningless vitamin complex with some minerals at dosages that are totally negligible like it makes me wonder dude like why like when you're going to make a product how many of these fucking manufacturers are like you know what let's uh let's put in like a micro amount of sodium to make it seem like we're trying to uh you know maintain fucking hydrate you during your workout you know let's uh to replace what you're sweating out the 60 milligrams that's really going to make a difference the potassium at 20 milligrams less than one percent of your daily intake gotta include that like some of the stuff you do need to include as like a byproduct of it being like bound to fucking some of this stuff but in general when you see this kind of a profile it's like what are you accomplishing or is it just to beef up the label and make it look more impressive and hide the fact that your the real formula is really just this you know what are we looking at here we're looking at micronized creatine monohydrate now when you see this performance blend we know it is a proprietary blend whereby the total amount included in this blend is 4.9 grams so we already know an efficacious dose of creatine monohydrate is you know how many people know it's fucking five grams like how many people would know i want to see five grams in my daily intake for having my saturation of creatine so they're not even hitting that with the most highest dose ingredient in here so you would speculate this is probably at three grams or something which is dumb because it's cheap so why not just fucking put the full amount in and it's like the fact that you're under five we already know you're undercutting us on this severely now we get to the beta alanine they must at most have like one and a half grams seeing as the rest of the shit is in here arginine akg not a big fan it's not that it's you know as far as arginine preparations as far as like a nitric oxide precursor frankly like i clearly prefer l-citrulline i also find things like uh inositol stabilize arginine silicate pretty useful if you're trying to conserve space but if you are trying to make like a giant blend that is effective would i be putting in something like akg at fucking like 500 milligrams to a thousand milligrams no i would be putting in an efficacious amount of you know l-citrulline or something that is you know tried and true and is uh very effective and then here they top off their blend with the sodium site <laughs> And this is in their performance blend with these fucking dosages. Okay, so I guess you can extrapolate and probably get maybe like three grams of creatine, one and a half grams of beta alanine, maybe like 500 fucking milligrams of AKG or something. Not too impressive in my opinion. Sports energy blend. Okay, so we have 1.135 grams. So we have a bit of taurine. Caffeine is disclosed at 135 really milligrams. Bad. Like clearly Shit. this is tailored towards the Amazon consumer. Like this is designed to be a cost-effective price point have good margin still despite the fact that it is you know a 30 serving product and like at least be noticeably effective but still please the general mainstream audience have a hit of caffeine have a little bit of creatine have kind of the base needs covered not that i would consider this covered whatsoever but you can see it's a very tailored to the mainstream audience who doesn't understand how to read a supplement facts panel and you know interestingly enough the fucking thing is four and a half stars with seven thousand reviews so obviously the mainstream gen pop doesn't know doesn't give a fuck they just like the fact that it's 19 dollars tastes like blue raspberry and fruit punch probably tastes good because it's easy to make a flavor system for a product that has a subpar blend with fucking nothing in it really and um you know they just they feel like they're getting their bang for the buck because it's less than 20 bucks and it's with amazon prime so obviously if you're comparing a 19 dollar product to a 40 plus dollar product like what do you think is uh the the average gen pop consumers are oh my god you know like 30 servings like i'm clearly getting more for my money here for half the price like that's the kind of logic that goes into the shit so i'm not surprised to see this but frankly even for 20 bucks you could have taken like you'd be, be you'd be better off doing just like a big hit of creatine or a big hit of caffeine a saturation dose of creatine if you're gonna use beta alanine at least hit more than a few grams in there and um i don't know like add 
one nitric oxide precursor that is like at a reasonable dose and that could be top out your entire blend you don't need to inflate it with all this other bullshit but i get it you're trying to make it look impressive in order to appeal to the general consumer they get confused when they see the shit they just see c4 performance blend energy blend and they get impressed and they see you know the fucking 7,000 reviews because this thing's probably cranking ads out the wazoo and um the price point they go for it and i imagine the same thing is for uh ripped sport 21.99 it's probably the fucking same thing pretty much citrulline malate at what do you know 3.9 grams for the entire blend so what do you think the citrulline malate is in here i don't know two grams if you're lucky you know and then of that how much is actual free form l citrulline <laughs> like 1.33 grams and then you have like six uh, 666 milligrams of fucking mal malic acid um l-carnitine at a dose that is totally useless orally um again the same kind of energy blend again not impressed dude but for the price point i see why it works you know i can see why there is the general appeal of the main gen pop audience that is going to eat this shit up now the original pre-workout this is a fucking nostalgic product right here yeah kind of the same kind of the same thing dude i'm not a I'm not a big fan um i'm just gonna skip this one let's go to uh their ultimate oh the walmart pre let's see what is in here holy shit this is horrible 500 milligrams for their pump complex like there is not one product in here that is effective at this dosage even on its own let alone fucking combined into one 500 milligram culmination the pre-workout what's with the 135 milligrams like why is that the sweet spot for these kind of like mainstream pre's like, I don't get it. That's not that's not equivalent to a cup of coffee. Like, I don't get what the logic is. Like, how did you arrive at that number? Did they just, like, start copying each other? Or what the fuck? Creatine monohydrate at an, eff at an efficacious 1,500 milligrams. Like, why? I don't get it. Like, why not just put in the five grams? Is it that much more expensive? It's not, you know? $14. Okay, now I, get, now I get it. I thought this was at least going to be 20, but no, dude. That is, uh, that's cost effective. Now I get it. 12,817 ratings. You won't get the amount you pay for. Dude, <laughs> there's less than a quarter of the container. Blah, blah, blah. Hmm. Scam bait. Imagine having a guy, well, I guess like he has a point, but I mean, imagine complaining about a $14 fucking product. Uh, like you get what you pay for, bro, is what I would say in general. Unless, like obviously there could have been some fuck up, but I mean like, when you buy a $14 pre, like what, <laughs> what do you expect in terms of quality? C4 Ultimate Pre-Workout. Uh, let's see. So this is their like premium product that is uh, maxed out, I would assume. So uh, let's see. Um, we've got the Super Citrulline. They have a typo. Interesting. I would think like a mega company would not fuck this up. Citrulline with one L, pump matrix. L Citrulline, like this is the kind of stuff I catch in like two seconds. Like, I don't get how a top tier company that's probably mass producing this in the tens of thousands of units is not able to pick up something like this. Like imagine printing out like 200,000 labels and then realizing, oh shit, I oh fucking misspelled citrulline, even though we have it three times after that correctly. So anyway, six grams of the entire citrulline complex. It's kind of weird how oh, they are. Sucks, like, dude, to me, this screams over complicating it to make you confused and think it's more comprehensive. Like, what would you be better off with doing? Dude, are you getting additional benefit by splitting the citrulline and citrulline malate into four and one gram? Or would you just be better off with having six grams of citrulline malate on its own? Now I get, obviously there is the nitrate bound component of this, which can give you some more of a nitric oxide boost as kind of a uh, backdoor way of increasing it without the standard citrulline. If there is more than one way to increase nitric oxide levels in the body. Citrulline is going to be a different vector than uh, nitrate. But in general, like splitting this up in this manner to me is just like, oh, look, we have like two versions of it. And in, in reality, this is not even chemically bound L-citrulline malate. It is citrulline with malic acid blended in a vat and it's called citrulline malate in order to write on your label something different when in reality, this should all just be L-citrulline and then malic acid separately to show us what we're actually getting. Um, beta alanine, 3.2 grams, considered the clinically efficacious dose, even though you need 179 grams in totality to get the performance enhancing effects you want out of it. And nobody is going to get that in a stimulant containing pre-workout because no one is going to take this shit every single day. And, um, yeah, like I don't, just not my favorite ingredient with the itchy butthole and the fucking itchy foot. And, uh, you can't even scratch it because you're in the gym and what are you going to do? Stick your thumb up your ass while you're working out? Obviously not. Here we are with the creatine hydrochloride. Oh, the fancy, fancy creatine. That is so much better. Really One funny. gram patented creatine. I need to watch that part. Holy shit. Holy shit, this is horrible. 500 milligrams.
put it that way. And, and again, something that could no. foot and uh, you can't even scratch it because you're in the gym and what are you going to do? Stick your thumb up your ass while you're working out? Obviously not. Here we are with the creatine hydrochloride. Oh, the fancy, fancy creatine. That is so much better. So one gram patented creatine HCL. Goddamn, son. Clearly beats monohydrate, right? Because it's fucking this new fancy thing. Nitrate bound creatine. Again, something that could leverage another pathway for nitric oxide. But again, your creatine dose is subpar. Why not just put in the proper amount? Why not do it? I don't get it. It's not that expensive. Taurine, one gram. I use a few grams of this separately myself. Okay. 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 That was Holy shit, this is horrible. 500 milligrams for their pump complex. Nitrate bound creatine. Again, something that could leverage another pathway for nitric oxide. But again, your creatine dose is subpar. Why not just put in the proper amount? Why not do it? I don't get it. It's not that expensive. Taurine, one gram. I use a few grams of this separately myself. I do not think this is an efficacious dose. Granted, there is, uh, I don't know, like it's not, I'm not impressed by this dose, just put it that way. And uh, N-acetyl L-tyrosine, the format of tyrosine that is not bioavailable and does absolutely nothing at a subpar dose as well. Caffeine, a 300 milligram dose, obviously reasonable. You know, if you can't feel that, something's wrong with you in my opinion. Alpha GPC, 200 milligrams. I would want to see a minimum of 600 to be considered efficacious for performance enhancement purposes. Raul sign, the thing that is going to make you feel like your pre-workout is a special stimulant fucking blend and it's different than the rest, when in reality, this can ruin it for some people. This is why we don't include things like Raul sign, isopropyl norepinephrine, theophylline, shit in pre-workouts like that can literally make or break it for some individuals. For some people who are such stimulant junkies, they need to feel the fucking hyperadrenergic signaling to actually think their pre-workout is effective. But for a lot of other individuals, they will literally feel like borderline hypoglycemic, sketched out, like these are not clean stimulants necessarily. Now, Raul sign alpha yohimbine is cleaner than yohimbine. That's why we choose it. But at the end of the day, I prefer it for its fat burning qualities as a leverage, as a fasted pre-workout agent, not as a pre-workout ingredient. Um, fasted cardio, I meant to say, not fasted pre-workout. I'm not sure if I said that, but could you stack Raul sign on top of our pre-workouts? Yes, you could, but there's a reason why we sell it separately because I don't want you forced to take Raul sign in order to take our pre-workout because it could. And for me, it does ruin the pre-workout. I don't want to be on Raul sign while I'm lifting. I want to be on Raul sign while I'm doing fasted cardio. Um, t crane at a dose that does absolutely nothing. Overhyped ingredient, in my opinion, used to have a lot of hype behind it and it uh, doesn't feel like fucking anything to me. Now, granted, some people who are more sensitive may feel it. They feel it's like a smoother, you know, decent non dependence or tolerance building, you know, like stimulant alternative. If you're gonna use this, you have to use a way higher dose. It's very expensive. And frankly, it doesn't really move the needle in my opinion. I used to have this in Gorilla Mind Smooth and I removed it just because it was not overly useful in my opinion. I would rather use my capsule space for something more efficacious. Who pairs in a 50 micrograms? Personally, I'd rather see 200 here at least. So anyways, that's like their hyper aggressive formula. And that's kind of what you expect from Amazon, dude. Like I'm surprised we're even in the top 15, to be honest. I don't know how we qualified. It's not something we really try and, you know, like go after to, you know, push the Amazon sales that hard. But I guess it's not unexpected that the watermelon one's the only one that's ranked top because it is the only prime flavor. So it should be interesting as we get more stuff into prime if we start climbing the ranks. Like here we are at number 42 for Gorilla Mode Nitric. Um, obviously I think we deserve <laughs> higher than that. Like fucking bang energy is above us. Honey Badger, Naked Aid, goddamn beta alanine raw powder is ranked above us for like every product on here. So anyways, that, you know, to me, I thought that was interesting. This is me actually going through it for the first time with you guys. I just saw the preview um, last night and figured this might make a cool video. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that little uh, dissection of uh, some of the top products in the industry and my thoughts on them in general. So anyways, hope you guys enjoyed that. If you want to support the channel, obviously check out Gorilla Mind, Gorilla Mode, pre-workout formulas that designed myself from scratch for the most efficacious formulas. I literally sit down and design on a Word document myself. I do not have a manufacturer that I outsource the fucking design to. I do not have somebody who tries to find us the best margin formula in order to maximize profits on something like Amazon. Rather, I just put out what I think works that I want myself. And if it happens to do well on Amazon, great. If not, fucking oh well, I will sell it through my own platform. And uh, people who find the, uh, who can recognize the value will uh, get it. So anyways, check that out. It's all in the video description below. You can save 10% on your order on our main site, obviously, with the coupon code in the video description. Um, and anything else I'm associated with, it's all in the video description below. And uh, like, subscribe. 
Uh, what else? Check out my blog. I usually do. I usually do the product plugs like after the fucking social media, so I'm all thrown off right now. Um, follow me on Instagram, at Plates for Dates, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. What's funny is some of those social media platforms I like don't even post on now, so I'm pretty sure. Bitch, you, you don't even need to follow me. I don't even fucking care. Anything else? All in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon. How can we get really jacked and also really strong at the same time? A lot of people seem to think you can't, or at least you shouldn't, because how you should train to get strong is very different from how you should train to get big, they say. But I don't really agree with this. Yeah, if you're interested in that topic, you can check out Mac Israel from Renaissance Periodization and Jeff Nippert, so they did videos on that, and I watched them a bit. I really wouldn't say I really absorbed a lot of the information. So yeah, I don't know if anyone's watching me right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm just listening to YouTube videos, man. Yep, nobody's watching. Alright, whatever. I'm gonna do commentary anyway, fuck. Five ways to improve your kicks, way ahead of you, mate. I have proposed on this channel numerous times that we need to re-examine our definitions of fitness. Too many people will focus on only one or two aspects of fitness when training. A tear just fell from my eye. Someone get me the Kleenex for the tear. It comes from a lack of knowledge, a desire to be the best in a specific domain, or a tribalism that keeps them wed to a single system. Cross training with multiple disciplines, ignoring the tribalism in fitness. Messages that I also promote numerous times in this channel in relation to fitness concepts. And this is literally the only clip ever where I will not make fun out of someone jumping over a bin. Because his video was ducking sensational. Here is younger, more moisturized me. Also relates to the idea of cross training. If you're looking in their video, it's not just resistance training. He's also performing running. And I love the idea of performing multiple disciplines. However, I frequently cross train. I love cross training. I find the different forms of physical activity keep me looking young and keep my hair bouncy. Welcome to the positive message health playlist. My intention with these videos is not to make you go and follow channels or to tell you who to like or dislike. It is simply that there is a strong positive fitness message within a video or videos from another channel that I want to communicate to this community as I think it could be very productive. And in this video, I'm highlighting the best fitness video that I've seen this year. The next question is, what are these different aspects that we need to train? How do we define them? I've compiled a list of what I believe to be the pillars of fitness and performance. Agility is a combination of strength, speed and mobility, but combined with grace born from proprioception, balance and posture. Meet the Bioneer. I enjoy comic books, working out, computer games, travel and sandwiches. And so funnily enough, he is from the same place as me in the UK and we are around the same age. I clearly aged better. And this young lady is also from Bournemouth, so pipe down. Or I will do the hand thing on you. And I can finally get some sleep. These wrinkles need some rest. The amount of comments I've got about this guy. Basically, I wake up, comb my hair, read Bioneer messages and repeat. You might laugh at the person who learns to juggle to supplement their fitness training. When will they ever need that kind of hand-eye coordination? Well, they won't until they do. And they're no less likely to need that skill than they are to be able to squat 250 kilograms. And so he makes videos in a different style to other channels. Physical fitness, science, technology, psychology, martial arts and other issues. Rope climbing at home, wrist and little finger strength. He's just doing it for the views. And he made this recent video oh which God, nails dude. such a vital aspect of fitness and health. Pillars right, of fitness. Sounds that. a bit like an <laughs> Elliot Holsey book. Don't make me breathe through my balls. Types of fitness everyone should train for. But simply being able to squat and deadlift huge amounts of weight is not fitness, nor is it the be all and end all of leg strength. How about single leg strength? How about rotation? After a certain point, adding more and more weight causes more issues in other aspects of your fitness. Just as there is more to strength than squatting, strength itself is not the ultimate expression of fitness and performance. As I've said before on this channel, there are certain specialisms or sports which are projected as fitness. And we've seen throughout the years in magazines or websites or popular YouTube channels involving people who are elite in these specialisms. Now, I'm not demeaning those disciplines at all. Those areas require a great amount of discipline, 
work consistency, but those are specific sports, specialisms, and in many cases they are elite pursuits of certain attributes, for example powerlifting and strength. They represent elements of fitness, but when we think about fitness and health on a wider scope to a wider population base, when we think of movement, strength, mobility, flexibility, proprioception, reaction time, speed, power, endurance, the list goes on and on. Perhaps we have to cast the net wider to what fitness and health really is. Many others equate fitness to cardiovascular endurance. Fit to them means being able to run long distances without throwing up. They lose mass and size, they lose the ability to move explosively, and they miss out on opportunities to explore the full range of motion their bodies are capable of. Again, I want to reiterate here that this makes sense if you're an endurance athlete, if that's your career, but for the rest of us, focusing on just one single area of fitness like this just doesn't make sense. And I made a video on the buff dudes, and one factor that I focused on was the buff dudes, who were very much traditional resistance trainers, taking up running as that was a weakness, and they took that up as a form of branching out into other disciplines, and how great it was to see that. And so it's the reverse scenario of the Bioneers example, but it's the same point. We can class this, if you like, as holistic fitness development. And I've made videos on different areas, such as climbing. There's so much that goes into this, and it's highly impressive. The Pablo Escobar pre-workout is also clearly working. What about quick decision making and general cognitive performance? The athlete who wins a contest is rarely the one who is strongest or fastest or most endurant. More important is how they are able to apply those traits on the day by remaining focused, motivated and calm. And so with cognitive performance this is not my area so I'm just going to leave his clip for you but I am aware of different models into cognitive performance and it's a highly interesting area to explore in a fitness channel. How about bringing all of that together into one beautiful ensemble? A symphony of strength, agility, quickness, decision making and explosive power. And so we can think about a transfer of attributes here. When you train for certain attributes, how does that translate to the daily physical challenges in your life? This video is intended to project what health and fitness is beyond what we commonly see as a path to an aesthetic. And health and fitness is related to longevity, for enjoyment, for preparing you for daily physical challenges, for preparing you for potential emergency situations and of course to decrease the risk of disease. And that discipline that we get from an exercise program can also translate to other parts of your life. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? How can we work on our weak points? How can we then, after doing these tests, alter our yearly training to try and become more well-rounded? The next question is, what are these different aspects that we need to train? How do we define them? I've compiled a list of what I believe to be the pillars of fitness and performance. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but rather just a starting point and hopefully the start of a conversation. These are the basics that I think everyone should consider training. And so here are his pillars of fitness, and I'm basically just going to play his clips because they really do speak for themselves. Strength. Strength is the ability to exert force on the environment. This could be to move an object, to move yourself, to break an object apart, or to prevent movement. Strength can further be broken down into subtypes. Max strength is the peak output you're capable of exerting, often measured by your one rep maxes. Explosiveness is the amount of strength you can exert quickly, also known as rate of force production. Explosiveness makes for powerful punches and explosive vertical jumps. To be useful, strength should be accessible on any vector. It's not just enough to be strong in a constrained movement pattern like the squat or the deadlift. Rather, you should be strong when pushing horizontally from an upright stance, strong in the transverse plane, and strong in unbalanced unilateral movements. And again, planes of motion is something that I've touched on in this channel, and this communication is just excellent. Resistance training and different applications of strength, of course, are vital. This is how the real world demands us to be strong, whether loading a boot, moving furniture, or wrestling an opponent. All three at the same time. Speed. Decent film. Speed is the ability to move quickly from one point to another. Or that. Look at that, Tash. Sorry I had to. It's like if the Chuckle Brothers could fight. Movement speed, which includes acceleration, deceleration, lateral speed and linear speed, as well as direction changes. And I made a video on the WWE and training, and I touched on the speed ladder as one tool of training that people may not incorporate, which they may think about. Quickness or limb speed, and reflexes. Speed is a combination of rate of force production, explosiveness, along with efficient movement and neural drive. My real life example was way more accurate than his though. The goal here is to be able to run quickly when you need to, which could genuinely save your life. It does also have applications to your everyday life. For example, when you spot that person down the high street that you don't want to talk to and you do a quick 180. How does your training transfer to a potential emergency situation? This is something I've covered on my channel also. And the example I like to give is, can you pull your own weight? In an emergency situation, 
could you pull your own body weight? And this could be, for example, a pull-up motion. But the idea on a deeper level is something that I've also liked to project. You should be fast in a variety of environments too, whether swimming or running uphill or across uneven terrain. And that quickness should extend to smaller movements, whether throwing a punch, catching a ball or ducking. Endurance. Endurance represents your ability to continue to express strength and speed for long duration. In a real world setting, it's rare that you are ever required to perform a single feat of incredible strength. Far more often, you're required to exert that strength for a significant duration. Endurance, and so the application here is muscular endurance, and I've defined muscular endurance in a recent video, and I don't remember which one. And if you do know which video I talked about that in, you need to get out more. Joking, thank you so much for watching my videos. Muscular endurance, of course, the repeated contraction of muscles over time. Carrying heavy objects long distances is more useful than lifting extremely heavy objects a single time. Aerobic endurance is the ability to run, walk or row long distances at sub-maximal exertion. Farmer's walks, one of my favourite exercises. The scientific definition for the farmer's walk is a worldie of an exercise. This is the low intensity, steady state cardio you experience on a 10k run. And so in my Eddie Hall video I explain the aerobic threshold and so I love how here he goes into different energy systems. Concepts such as the aerobic threshold, heart rate, intensity, intervals and anaerobic pathways of producing energy are therefore required. We can think about different types of fitness, different energy systems, the more explosive anaerobic energy systems for sprinting, for example, power activities versus the more aerobic, more endurance based energy systems. How does the training you do translate to those energy systems? Agility. Agility is a combination of strength, speed and mobility, but combined with grace born from proprioception, balance and posture. Agility involves changing direction quickly. Essentially it's a component of athletic performance and it involves many other attributes such as balance and coordination. And it's something that you may want to think about incorporating into your training program. This allows us to leap high into the air, balance along thin beams and contort our bodies in midair. So we must also train for that balance, that fine motor control and that coordination. We can do this with more ambitious calisthenics, gymnastic strength training, yoga and countless other protocols. And again, this is just excellent communication. I've made videos on several calisthenic channels recently. And part of the reason for me doing this was to project some of the great ideas and attributes that can come through calisthenic training, gymnastic training. Mobility and agility matter in everyday life because it prevents injury, giving us control in end ranges of motion, allowing us to save a bad landing or to right ourselves when we start to fall. And simply by gaining more range of motion and control in these positions, you'll be able to reduce tightness and discomfort. Cognitive function. Few people realise that they can train their brain just as they can train their body. Training the mind a highly interesting idea. Their habits and career shape brain regions and the connections between them via neuroplasticity. Even fewer people make this training part of their routine. But training the mind is what would ultimately lead to the most tangible rewards for most of us. There's a recent podcast by Rich Roll with Dr. Andrew Huberman, which I listen to, which also applies to these issues. And so again, this is not something that I can talk on in depth as it's not my area, but this is a highly interesting communication in his channel, in this video. And let's be honest, it's something that's massively lacking from YouTube fitness as a whole. And so he raises more issues than that, but I think I've given you an idea from what I've shown you as to his projection. Just wanted to say a massive thank you to everyone who supports the channel who watches who comments who likes i'm humbled by it and i can't thank you enough and i appreciate every single one of you commonly people focus on for example muscle growth and fat loss perhaps strength gains which are all good and valid goals of course however perhaps there is a need for us to think about further fitness and health related attributes that we can develop Alright guys, we've got a rainy day here in Jacksonville today, but we're going to go hit a back workout anyway. I'm going to make a run for the car. So guys, uh, what I decided I'd do is a quick Q&A video. So I got a ton of questions. I think there was over 5,000 comments on my million subscribers video. So thanks for all the amazing comments, all the support, and all the great questions. I was actually really impressed with the caliber of questions that you guys asked. Um, so what I did was I went through and tried to pick the ones that got a nice few upvotes so that, um, that there are at least questions that you guys probably wanted to hear me talk about. So I picked 16 uh, out of the 5,000 that I just screenshot as I was going through. Uh, 52 today, bro. And I'm going to answer 52. 
in this video and then I'm gonna answer the next eight in another video. And we're on the way to the gym right now to hit a back workout. So I'll just overlay some of the clips from the back workout and answer you guys' questions. So I'll check in with you guys over at the gym. All right, so guys, what I decided I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sip on my Kiwi Lime Prolific pre-workout here and uh, answer my questions as I sip on this and then uh, get into the workout after it. So we'll overlay the clips of the workout as I answer the questions. And yeah, let's dig into it. Okay, first question. How do you find motivation to go to the gym when having a bad day? Um, so for me, I basically set up a rule for myself that I'm just simply not gonna skip the gym because I'm having a bad day. And I think that this really speaks to the importance of having a training program that you can adhere to. I find if you're just totally freestyling it, you'll be so much more likely to have that temptation to skip. But if you can build trust in yourself that you're actually gonna stick to your program and get to the gym over time, then it just becomes less and less likely that you're gonna skip a workout um, just because you're having a bad day, which I don't think is a good excuse not to get to the gym. Now, one thing I used to do earlier on in my training career was I used to put a lot of pressure on myself to perform to my best ability even when I was having a bad day. Uh, but over time, I've realized that it's just perfectly normal for progress to wax and wane. You're gonna have good days, you're gonna have bad days. And if you're having a bad day, you should just accept that, continue to stick to the program and get all the work in. But if your lifts aren't necessarily as good as they would be on a good day, then you shouldn't beat yourself up about that and realize that you're gonna bounce back and get back to where you were anyway. And interestingly, I found that on days where I feel the worst going into the gym, those often end up being the best workouts for me. And sometimes when I feel amazing going to the gym, I'm feeling hyped and everything, uh, the weight just, for whatever reason, ends up feeling really heavy. So how you're feeling going into the workout isn't always a good predictor of how that workout ends up actually going. Um, so you wanna keep that in mind. And like I said, build trust in yourself and your ability to follow through on the program. And you'll be so much more successful long term. Hopefully that helps. Okay, question number two. What is the optimal amount of muscle mass relative to weight for health? And is there a point where the muscle have a negative effect? Okay, so I think that, this is an interesting question. So I think that most of the health benefits that we see from working out are a result of resistance training itself and the gains in strength that you see from that, not yeah, necessarily- Yeah, getting 52 with this mass. fucking base, dude. Per se. That's kind of just my opinion on it. I don't really have any research to support that. Wait. I feel like all the benefits in terms of improved bone mineral density, uh, better joint and ligament health, um, better strength, uh, prevention of, of strength loss as you age or muscle loss as you age, tend to come from just getting stronger, which is great from a general health perspective. And then you do have all these other peripheral health benefits like uh, improved insulin sensitivity, um, even improved cardiovascular health uh, from lifting weights. So there are a ton of positive health effects that come from resistance training. And I would say that there probably isn't a point where you'll build so much muscle naturally that it starts to have a negative effect. Those negative effects usually come from steroid abuse, where you build so much muscle that your heart just has to work so hard to pump all the blood throughout your system uh, that it ends up usually resulting in heart problems for people who've abused steroids for a long time. But I just don't think it's possible to build that much muscle naturally. So as a good rule of thumb, I would say the more muscle that you can carry naturally, probably the better, unless it results in also a really high body fat percentage. Now, one thing that I think a lot of people get confused about on this is that they assume that because someone looks very fit or very aesthetic, it necessarily means that they're healthier. And I would say it probably is true as a general rule of thumb. Like if someone looks fitter, they're probably healthier than the average sedentary person. But uh, on the flip side, I know a lot of fit people who look very aesthetic and muscular who actually aren't very healthy. And that usually comes as a result of being excessively lean. Um, so for men, for example, when you get below, let's say, 8 to 10% body fat, you start to run into all kinds of health complications, like low testosterone and then psychological issues like body image dysmorphia is really, really common as you get leaner. And with women, it's probably even worse when you get really lean. Uh, you can get amenorrhea, reduced bone mineral density, increased risk of osteoporosis, all kinds of bad stuff. Um, so just because you're lean doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy if it gets to the point that it's excessive. When it comes to uh, really high levels of muscle mass, another potential issue is overtraining to the point that it leads to injury or just overtraining in general. And I do see that in people who are really, really adamant about maximizing their muscle growth. Um, but when you keep moderation in mind, I would say that on the whole, weight training and building muscle is 
very positive for health, and I wouldn't say that there's a point where that starts to turn negative until you turn to steroids or if you just get overly obsessed with exercise in general. All right, question three. Can you do a video addressing rest times and how they change depending on how your training changes? Um, so I actually already did a video on rest times, but not a lot of people saw it because it was a fundamentals whiteboard video. Um, so I will quickly address this again because it did get a lot of upvotes. I think the main thing you want to keep in mind with rest periods is how it fits into the context of what's really fundamental for driving muscle growth. Um, so we know that volume is really important. There's a dose-response relationship between volume and hypertrophy, meaning the more volume you do up to a point, the more muscle growth you'll see. And we don't really know where that point is yet. Uh, we also know that progressive overload is very important for growth, so you need to be presenting a new and increased stressor to your body over time, whether it's increasing weight or uh, sets or uh, progressively getting better at form or whatever. And then we also know that there's a threshold of effort or intensity that you need to reach because it doesn't really matter how much volume you're doing or how well you're progressively overloading if you're not training hard at all. And that's probably somewhere around like an RP of seven or eight. So you do need to train hard and that matters. So what we need to think about is how do rest periods fit into the context of those more important acute training variables. And I would say that as a general rule, if you're resting not long enough, so if, you're, if your rest periods are too short between sets, then you're probably not going to be recovered to the point that you're going to be able to handle the same amount of weight, and so your volume is going to be diminished as a result. By the same token, if you're resting too long between sets, your workouts can get really dragged out, and you might not have the same amount of energy to put into your sets toward the end of your workout, and the intensity may be lower, right? Um, so I think that, as a general rule, a sweet spot is probably around one to two minutes of rest between sets that have, let's say, six to 15 reps, which should be the majority of your work if your primary goal is hypertrophy. For pure strength work, so stuff under, let's say, six reps, you'll wanna rest a little bit longer because they generally take a little longer to recover from. Uh, so something like, let's say, three to four minutes or maybe as high as five minutes if you're doing a really heavy set. And then for the really high rep stuff, I still generally don't recommend resting under one minute because all the research that we have tends to show better hypertrophy in uh, groups that train with longer rest periods or with rest periods longer than one minute. All right, next question. Do you think advice like cardio kills gains is taken to the extreme by people who want an excuse not to do cardio, thereby affecting their cardiovascular health? And what is the amount of cardio that can be optimally incorporated into a bodybuilding routine for health benefits, even if it slightly affects gains? Okay, those are two, those are two really good questions. And it's a little bit of a controversial area, so I'm gonna share my opinion on it. Um, before I do that, actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dig up the American Heart Association recommendations for cardio here. Give me two seconds. So, okay, I'll put this up out here on the screen as well. So the AHA, uh, as of 2015, recommends at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity at least five days per week for a total of 150 minutes or Come 25 on, minutes bro. of more vigorous activity oh. three days per week. However, I would say that those recommendations are generally being made for an average sedentary population. And I yeah, I gotta stop. I gotta stop listening to videos, bro. Ah, oh, fuck. Wow, the luck on this one is... Wow, dude. That was extremely shit. Oh, man. Yeah, I didn't beat any scores today. But my scores weren't too bad, in my opinion. Yeah, let's check out what kind of stats did I have on... Target switching. 
Yeah, I got a pretty fucking good score. So yeah, it's... It's alright. It's alright. But as Christmas guy said, don't look at your scores, bro. Just do the work, baby. Yeah, you're gonna notice something, maybe, I don't know. I, don't, I noticed I wasn't using a lot of my wrist for micro corrections, and it did me a lot good for my Amos, and I felt really well in my last game well ago while I was playing Apex, so yeah. Alright, it's time for me to 